setting the stage for planet formation, right? Said that uh, on Monday, yeah, we would talk about the cloud collapse, the formation of the disk, and the structure, which is uh, the, how we can understand the initial conditions for planet formation. And then today we'll talk about the building blocks, how to start the planet formation process. How do how do we form the 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 first uh, the uh, the first rocky objects in the protoplanetary disk. We call this the planetesimals, right? Which is the first rung in the ladder for how to form planets. So last time we talked about the fact that the planets form in discs are gas and dust, right? We have that the gas is hydrogen and helium, like pretty much everything in the universe. And the dust means ice and rock. And then we saw that a collapsing molecular cloud will have too much angular momentum, will have to settle into a disk. And that's why the planets are formed in this disk. Um, we saw also the average mass that this disk has, have, which is about 1% of the mass of the star. And that uh, we can separate young stellar objects in these different classes, right? We have class 0, class 1, class 2. And it seems that uh, this disk spend most of their time in the class 2, and that's where planet formation happens. So let's, uh, let's see that in more detail. So we have the, the, the building blocks. We have this disk of gas and dust. We have the dust grains. And somehow, we have to use these dust grains to form the planets. Right? So let's, uh, let's go by steps here. Let's consider first that small dust and how it will grow to form these first building blocks, these planetesimals, and then from that to form the planets. Planet formation is a process that goes for 40 orders of magnitude in mass. You start from very, very tiny grains, and then you build objects like Jupiter and brown dwarfs. So how does this happen? How do you grow so fast and so quickly uh, 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 and, and so many orders of magnitude in, in mass? Um, <clears throat> The, the process is sketched here, more or less, and we're going to go through the details of what we, uh, what I mean by each of these steps here along the way. You have that you start with these dust grains, and they're going to grow through coagulation, right? And then they're going to build the first pebbles, and then uh, there are processes that are going to convert these pebbles into planetesimals. Uh, the one that we're going to study today is called the streamings. In, 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 instability, and uh, we're also going to go for the coagulation. And then once the planetesimals are forming, they're going to collide with each other, but also create the remaining pebbles in the disk, by process called pebble accretion. And then by that way, you form the first protoplanets, the first rocky cores, uh, I mean, the, the planetary cores, the rocky planets. And if these cores get big enough, and if the conditions are right, they can accrete the gas. So this is a basic sketch of, the, of what I think the planet formation process looks like. But first things first, let's start from how dust grows. The process is not that much different than what happens if you don't clean your room often enough, right? You have dust grains all over the place, and you know, uh, depending on your cleaning habits, you may you may or may not see that uh, these dust grains can grow. Sorry? Correct. Correct. Yes. And that is a problem because at these sizes, it's electromagnetism that is helping you grow, right? Gravity is a very weak glue. If you get one pebble and uh, another one and get them close, they're not going to glue gravitationally, right? So if you throw two rocks against each other, you're not going to make a, a rock that is... Uh, uh, twice the size, you're probably going to fragment them. So these are these is the first barrier to to growth. We're talking about objects that are too small to grow gravitationally, but eventually they get too big to keep growing through electromagnetic uh, forces. So you have to have something in in between there in these two two stages from something that is small. Right, that keep, can keep growing through heat and stick mechanisms, and something that is big enough that can keep growing gravitationally. Thanks for that point. Indeed, the growth of, at this stage is by heat and stick mechanisms. Right. So first, let's try to understand how this process goes. 
the very first thing is what kind of dust grains do we have to start with? That's not the same kind of dust grains that we have here. These, these are the dust grains that we have here in your room, everywhere, on, um, on the planet here in, in this room. But in space, what we have are the interstellar dust grains. So what, what are the interstellar dust grains? What is it that we have to start with? So this is one of the most well-cited papers in astronomy. Uh, we call this the MRN distribution. The MRN after the initials of the first authors here, Mattis, Fump, uh, Rumpel, and Norslag. What they did here is to, to find out what are the, the types of dust grains that explain the extinction in the interstellar medium. And what they find is this power law distribution here. They tried the two different types of... Uh, of grains of uh, different composition. You see here graphite and olivine uh, differ by this quantity A here. But, and they see that they both uh, are following this power law here of uh, index minus 3.5. A here is the size of the dust grains. So there are these two things here that we get from this. First is this uh, power law decay, right? So there are a lot of small grains and not so many of the bigger grains. But even when you talk about the bigger grains, this is in micrometer. We're talking about sub-micrometer size grains. So these are the grains that you start with. Also, uh, you don't need to trust the, uh, the opacity models because you can actually collect interplanetary dust with the uh, day space missions that we send to the planets. Uh, Ulysses and Galileo made this experiment and measured the dust grains that were impacting the spacecraft. The uh, uh, assumption here is that these are the same grains that are in between the stars. And what you see here, again, is a peak at around 7 micron size, the bigger grains having about micron size, right? So this is what we have to start with. You start from dust grains that are sub-micron and micron size, you put them into this disk, and what is going to happen? They're going to start heating, colliding, and growing, right? So in this way, you will grow these disks. Oh, sorry, these uh, grains in disks. Question is then, how far do they grow? Right? You start from these micro-sized grains. How big do these dust grains grow? So this is built here in this calculation. And <coughs> should have started immediately. That's built in here in this calculation. You start here with the disk radius, and here's the disk size. So they are modeling here the, these heat and stick mechanisms. And as you see, it's growing to about one centimeter, about, you know, so this is one centimeter, this is a meter. These dust grains are growing everywhere in the disk, but it seems that they hit a point beyond which they don't grow any further. This line here is a line of maximum drift. And what do we mean by this? As you put these dust grains in a disk, they will grow, but it seems that eventually they grow so large that they are lost to the star. So if, if this is correct, planets shouldn't exist, because you lose all of the dust grains to the star. But we have very good evidence that planets exist, right? We are sitting on one now. So there is something something off here. There's something that we still need to, to understand uh, how to keep it, the dust grains. But first, why are these grains drifting? And for that, to understand that, we needed to understand the structure of the disk. That's something that we didn't talk about yet. The reason why these, these dust grains are drifting is because the, the gas and the grains are subject to slightly different forces, right? You have, you have what? You have gravity, right? The gravity from the star. Uh, you have the centrifugal force. And on the case of the gas, you have the gas pressure. But on the case of the grain, you have a drag force, right? The grains are not feeling the pressure. So, how do, we, how do we find out what the state of the disk is? I pre-put here the, uh, um, the, uh, the equations of hydrodynamics that are giving you the base state of the disk. So, what you see here is the equation for the density. That's the equation of continuity. 
this, uh, these are the equations for the, uh, the three components of the, uh, the, uh, the velocity uh, vector. Right, so the radial component, there's a motor component and the vertical, and the equation of state that relates the pressure, the density, and the sound speed in the disk. So if you want to find the, the structure of the disk, what is it that, that we do? First of all, we need to find a steady state solution. Right? The disk is not changing its state in, in time. If these are the equations for the gas. So what is the first thing that we do? If we are in the situation of steady state, so here I'm going to put what the assumptions are. The assumptions are and I'm calling it assumptions in a good way. This could as well be constraints. The first one is steady state. Which mathematically translates into all of the time derivatives being equal to zero. So that's already a good thing. I can cut all of the left-hand sides here. Right? Now, the other assumption that I'm going to make here is the assumption of azimuthal symmetry. Right? When you look at a disk like this, you see that there is symmetry in the azimuthal direction. So the quantities are not varying with the azimuthal direction. Azimuthal symmetry. All of the uh, derivatives in the azimuthal direction cancel out. Right. <clears throat> now, I'm considering also that the disk, even though it is rotating right, in, the, uh, in the azimuthal direction, there are no motions of the gas in the radial or in the vertical direction. So the gas is not moving up, upwards, and the gas is not moving sideways either. That means that all of the radial velocities and the vertical velocities are zero. There we go. So there are more things that we can cut. Everything that is R here is going to be cut. So no radial velocities. Oh, I also forgot to cut here this. Um, no vertical velocities either, so vertical velocity here, zero. No radio, no vertical. There you go. Hydrodynamics, it's uh, scary at first when you put all of the, uh, the terms, but you, know, you make this assumption, then you go cutting several of these terms. Make the equations definitely a lot simpler. So what are we left with here? We are left with very little. You see that the continuity equation, all of the terms canceled out, right? So that's fine. On the azimuthal equation, the same thing. All the terms canceled out. Nothing's left. The only terms that are left here are in the vertical direction, the pressure and the gravity. That's hydrostatic equilibrium. And on the radial direction, you have almost the same thing. You have gravity. You have the pressure. This would give you hydrostatic equilibrium, but you also have the centrifugal force. So that gives you a condition of centrifugal balance. So that's the structure of the disk. The disk in the vertical direction is in hydrostatic equilibrium, and in the radial direction is in centrifugal balance. Right? There's very little left here. What we have is in the radial direction, then, This is in the radial direction, and then in the vertical. There we go. <coughs> the vertical equation gives us already what the, uh, this, the, uh, the vertical structure of the disk is. Because what is it that we have? We have the pressure, and we have the equation of state. So we can substitute the equation of state in here, in this. And um, further, we can assume that the disk uh, temperature does not vary. Yes? 
Uh, the capital R is the cylindrical radius. And little r is the spherical radius. Right. So radius in cylindrical coordinates and radius in spherical coordinates. So let's split here and let's make another assumption here that the sound speed depends only on the radio direction but not on the vertical direction, right? Uh, which is an assumption that is validated by the fact that the disk is optically thick and is being irradiated by the star, right? So there is a, a, a difference in the temperature of the disk when it gets to the atmosphere, but the mid plane of the disk up to a certain height right, is still isothermal. Right, so if we substitute the pressure in here, <coughs> what we have then is CI squared, so the sound speed squared over the density, and then you have again here the derivative of the density. Derivative of a quantity over the quantity, that's the derivative of the logarithm of the quantity. So we can, we can now separate this into quantities that are depending on z and quantities that are not depending on z, and integrate this. Uh, sorry, if we multiply and divide those by sound speed, <coughs> we have an equation here for the density. Integrate now on both sides. What do you have? None of these quantities here will be depending on z, except for this one, so the r cube, right? So <coughs> we can expand this. Actually, that was to the power of 3 halves. Sorry. Right, what I did here was expand the, this little r into uh, the cylindrical radius, right, plus the, the, the vertical coordinate, and now we are ready to integrate this. So we can uh, we can integrate this by writing the uh, the square root in this form, and then expand this in in series. So this will become square root of one z plus r. This integral here then will give you the density as a function of radius and the vertical coordinate. You can expand, uh, sorry, you get here then the dependency on radius and an exponential gm over cs squared. And then, uh, okay, I'm going to write here to this side too. Square root of r squared plus z squared minus one over r. And now using this expansion, you get rid of the square root. Take this r here out. Then you get one minus one over half of z over r square minus one. You cancel the minus one, and you have something much simpler. Z 
is square. Sorry. So this quantity here, what do we have? We have a z squared, right, over 2. So this quantity here must have a dimension of uh, 1 over length squared. Right. So I'm going to call this 1 over h squared, where this h is a scale height. So this is the density structure that we have then for the disk. It's an exponential of this quantity here. And h is defined in this way. C s square r cube gm. And you will re remember from Kepler's laws that this quantity here, gm over r cube, that's the Kepler frequency, right? Thus, h squared is the sound speed squared over omega squared. Remove the, <coughs> remove the squares, and then you have this all-important quantity, which is the definition of the scale height. So we call this quantity here the disk scale height. Yes? No, no, this is the mass of the star. Okay. Yes, exactly. This is the mass of the star. In this case, here is the sun. Yes. Right. That's another thing, too. We are assuming here that the gravitational potential is only the gravitational potential of the star. That's true that, in principle, you would need to take into account the self-gravity of the disk. But we are making the assumption here that the gravitational potential is dominated by the star. Because we are informed by the fact that the mass of the disk is much, much less than the mass of the star. Right. Good. Mm. So what, to do, what did we learn here from this? We learned that the structure of the disk is Gaussian. Right. We have this exponential here of z squared over h squared. It's uh, a Gaussian. Now, if this is the scale height that is giving us the height of the disk, we can compare the height of the disk with uh, the radius and define this other quantity here, the scale height of the disk over the radius, which is the aspect ratio, right? That tells you how, how, how tall the disk is compared to how wide it is. So you see here, H in this case is what? It's, uh, um, H is C over omega. And you can write the R in terms of the, the circular velocity of the disk, which is omega R, right? So you can substitute this R here by V over omega. So you have V over omega, and then you can cut the, the omegas. What you have here then, so let's put here V Keplerian, you have that this quantity is in fact the Mach number, the inverse of the Mach number. Right of uh, the disk. And uh, at the position of Jupiter, we have that the uh, temperatures in the disk are about uh, what? About 180 Kelvin. The Keplerian velocity, Jupiter is about, what, 10 kilometers per second. The sound speed at this temperature here is about uh, half a kilometer per second, so about 500 meters per second. So you have the sound speed, you have the Keplerian velocity, divide one by the other, you have the disk scale height. giving you 0 0.5 over 10, 0 0.05. So this disk is thin, 
this is 0 0.05, that's the aspect ratio of the disk. We're talking about very flattened disks. Right, so you can play the same game here for the other equation. Now, so we found here the vertical structure of the disk. You can apply the same algebra, and I'm not going to, to, to redo all of uh, the algebra, but for the radial part, right, we solved here the vertical. The vertical was this one, this equation, and this is the solution that it gave us. Now, if you do the same thing for the radial, this one here, Uh, you see here how the algebra is done, so I don't need to, to repeat it. You can do it on your own. But uh, if you do that for the, for the radio component of the equation, and I'll substitute this pressure that we just found on this, what you're going to find is that the... The, the Keplerian frequency, I'm sorry, the frequency that the, the disk rotates, you solve it for u phi, right? And u phi is omega r. What we want to find here is what is a, a, a omega. If you didn't have the pressure, it would be just this one, right? It would be given by, by Newton's laws, you would find Kepler's laws. However, the presence of the, the pressure changes that. That means that the disk is going to be uh, rotating with a frequency lower than Keplerian. If you make the assumption that uh, the radial component of the pressure falls as a, a power law of index P, and that the sound speed also falls, actually, let's call it by the temperature, also falls by a uh, power law of index K, uh, Q, and you solve this, you find that the frequency that the disk is rotating is given by the capillary fr frequency, but with a small correction due to this pressure gradient. So you see, P and Q here, we define it then as quantities that are positive. So all of this, uh, all of this part here will be uh, positive. So that uh, contributes a small correction. Small because of this quantity here, the aspect ratio, as we saw, is quite small. It's much less than 1. So there is a small correction to the rotation of the disk, right? of the order of the square of the aspect uh, ratio. So you see here, for a disk of this aspect ratio, 0 0.05, this correction is of the order of 10 to the minus 3, right? So quite small, but it is there. The gas is not rotating Keplerianly, right? It is rotating with a small sub-Keplerian correction. So going back then to what we were talking about, uh, that uh, uh, there is this sub Keplerian window that the dust grains are going to be filling because this is what the gas is doing. However, the dust grains are rotating at the Keplerian frequency. So there is a mismatch, right? The gas rotates at this speed. And let's call this quantity here, all of this quantity here is called eta. So eta is the sub-Keplerian correction. Right. P plus Q plus Q over 2. <coughs> 
0 over 8 squared. And I ran out of space here to, to write, sorry. <coughs> Times. So this is the velocity of the gas, but the dust grains are rotating with the capillary speed. So there is a wind, right, that is going on uh, between the gas and the grains. As the grains are orbiting in this disk, they're going to be losing angular uh, momentum due to this mismatch, right? Imagine that you are a dust grain orbiting in the disk. There is a headwind as you try to, to orbit. And uh, the, the dust grains, they are, they, they, are, they are feeling this because they are subject to a drag force, right? As they are orbiting, they lose angular momentum and then fall towards the star. Um, you can calculate how this, how this drift, I mean, how this uh, uh, angular uh, momentum loss happens as a function of the, uh, the drag force. So the, the equation of motion for the dust grains will be very similar to the equation of motion for the gas, except that uh, uh, the, the dust grains will be subject to a drag force. So let's call here dv dt, right? They have the same, sorry, they have the same form. I'm not going to write all of uh, the terms in here, but uh, I just want to highlight that you have the, the gravity in the same way. They're feeling the gravity of the star, but you also have now a drag force. Now let's write the drag force in this way, right? So that's the velocity of the dust grain minus the velocity of the gas and divided by a friction time. So what you're seeing here on the, y, on the x axis is the friction time. And this is the drift between the dust and the gas. What you're seeing here is that the dr drift is maximized when this friction time here is, um, well, let's call it T here. Tau is a normalization of this friction time if you multiply it by omega. So when the friction time is of the order of the Keplerian frequency, this drift is maximized. All right. So th this is what you are seeing here in this uh, simulation, is that uh, the dust is growing in size. As it grows, you're modifying this friction time here, because it depends on, on the size of the grain. And uh, when the, the friction time is off the order of one orbit, that's when this drift is maximizing, and then you lose the dust grains to the star. Now, this radial drift it turns out to be very, very, very fast. At 1 AU, is of the order of 100 years. Right? This is the most stringent constraint ever posed to forming planets. You form the dust, and you lose it in about 100 years. Right? So um, uh, I said right, uh, in, the, uh, in the first class that you have 10 million years to form planets. If this is the case, we only have 100 years. So that just cannot be the full uh, story. We're missing something here. And with that, I'm also going to give the definition, actually, of, uh, of pebble in, in disks. It's very different from what the geophysicists would be calling pebble because uh, they, they, will, you know, they will use a scale, I mean, a, a, uh, definition here based on geophysical conditions. So they talk about clay, silt, sand, pebbles, cobbles, and boulders. For us, a pebble is anything that drifts significantly within a disk lifetime, right? So the lifetime of the disk is about what? Uh, a million year, 10 million years, right? So that gives he here the, 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 um, uh, the threshold about which we would call something uh, a pebble, something that has a drift speed that is measurable within the disk uh, lifetime. So we're talking about particles that have this friction time here, right? This friction times over times the Keplerian frequency, this normalized friction time that is between about 10 to the minus 2 and about 10 to the 2. And this is a conversion 
of this friction times to particle size. So we're talking about things that are millimeter in size to things that are about, uh, about meter right, in size. So when we talk about uh, pebbles in the context of uh, planet uh, formation, we're talking about stuff on this size that are things that are drifting, right? things that are, uh, that are around this peak here of drift. Okay? Right, so according to that plot, stuff would be growing until they drift, which was about meter in size. If you remember here, seeing from this plot, this is the line of maximum drift. Huh? They drift inwards, towards the star, right? You form them, right, you and you grow the dust grains. Because they're feeling ahead when they're losing angular momentum, and then drift towards the star, right? Right. So according to that model, they will grow to about meter size before they drift in. But we have evidence that uh, the growth doesn't, grow, doesn't go all the way to meter size. It stops somewhere before that. In fact, when you look at meteorites, you see spheres of millimeters, sub, sub millimeter size, right? These are the chondrules. You take a cross section of a, a rock, and this is what you see, right? You see this, uh, these grains here that have been molten, right? But they, they come to, together to form a rock in space. So these grains, if they are characteristics of the dust grains that exist in this, because they should be at about millimeter in size. So they don't grow that large. Another piece of evidence comes from the observations. So uh, when you look at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at this, this protoplanetary disks, you try to fit their, their flux. You can model the, the, uh, the flux if you know the, uh, the opacity of uh, these disks. And uh, you see here different opacity curves are changing by what the maximum grain size is. So uh, uh, a typical opacity of uh, the interstellar medium would be this curve, right? the, uh, the brown curve. And then you have different curves for different maximum grain sizes. As the dust grows, what are you seeing here? You are depressing the opacity in visible wavelengths and in the near infrared, but you're growing here on the millimeter wavelengths. So there is a, a dependency on the maximum grain size on the slope of the, uh, the opacity in, in millimeter. This is what you see here. So the opacity depends on the frequency to this power of, uh, of beta. This beta here then is giving you what the maximum grain size is. So this is the distribution of maximum grain size in the disk versus this, this, uh, this spectral index, beta. For the ISM, so for very small grains, this, this beta will be about 1.5. And as the dust grows, it will change. First, I mean, it is not monotonic. It can go up, and it can go down, and it can also change depending on what kind of dust grain you have. But uh, the message here is that the spectral index will change as the dust grows. And we can measure that. So people do that. They do these maps of what this spectral index beta is uh, for different radii in the disk. This is for uh, the disk AS209. And you see here right, this difference in, in beta. And you can translate it. So first, you convert opacity to, to this index beta. And then you change from beta to the maximum grain size. Right? You, you, you fit with, uh, with the the models, what is the maximum grain size that you have to fit the flux. So this is this map done for this disk. And you can find that through, throughout most of the disk, the dust is only growing to about millimeter in size. Right? So that fits with what we had uh, before. So it turns out that the, the, there is something else that is limiting the growth. It is not just the drift. And here we are a bit at loss because the observations can only go so far. Once stuff starts growing beyond the millimeter, they disappear from the flux. Right? We don't have the means to, to, to see them because they are not emitting in, in, in significant quantities or in wavelengths that we can see, or both. 
So we can see stuff once they are small, so they interact a lot with, uh, with photons, or when they are big enough that they, uh, they reflect, right? But in this range here, we are pretty much blind to the observations, and you know, we need to rely on theory or laboratory experiments to tell us what is going on. And that's when stuff becomes fun. There are people that are doing these things in lab to find out what is the behavior of dust when it reaches this size. And they find the three simple outcomes. This is stuff that you can, you know, I mean, um, looks like child play, right? Like you just throw things at, at each other and see what, what will happen. And you found that they either bounce, stick, or break. <laughs> so that's, um, these are the, the three behaviors that these uh, that these small dust grains will have. As you can see here, they can bounce off each other. So in this case, there is no mass transfer. If they meet at very low speeds, you see here, they're going to stick, right? So you form a bigger dust grain. Or if you throw them at each other very high speeds, they're going to fragment. And that it seems to be the missing piece of uh, the, the puzzle here. The growth is fragmentation limited. So you 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 grow stuff in a disk. The, uh, because of the drag force, they lose angular momentum and fall towards the star, but because they're also meeting at high speeds, they will fragment. So we have two barriers to growth here. We have the, the drift barrier, and we also have the fragmentation barrier. So you're seeing here to, uh, the particle size that the dust grains are growing and the distance from the star. In typical fragmentation velocities for different uh, um, Compositions, pure silicate, water ice, uh, ammonia ice, and all. So the size that the dust grows is the size that is first hit here, if the fragmentation barrier or the drift uh, barrier. In this case, throughout most of the disk, growth is limited by the fragmentation barrier. This SC equal 1 is another name for this quantity here. Uh, tau fraction, this dimensional time. Sometimes we also call this ST for Stokes number. Right? So it's a non-dimensionalization of the friction time. And there we go. Here we have this so-called meter size barrier. For historical reasons, we call this meter size barrier because it is maximized for objects of meter size. But that doesn't mean the objects will grow to, to, to meter size. In this case, they're only growing to millimeter. Right? But it's still part of this meter size barrier, which is composed by this fragmentation barrier and the drift, right? You cannot grow stuff too large in disks because they will either drift or they will fragment. Yes? Correct. Ha, huh. very good question, thank you. Yeah, uh, so the, the speeds here, as you are in in, uh, as you are in small grains, you are very coupled to the gas. In this case, the, the speeds that will be given by Brownian motion, right? You, uh, um, you equate, so let me just use this. You equate the, uh, the kinetic energy to the thermal energy, and then you solve that, right, for what speeds you get. That's Brownian motion. That's for small grains. As you grow large, the disk actually will, will give what the speed is, because disks, they are turbulent. Right? That's, uh, I was going to get to that. Um, uh, the structure of the disk is such that you have a turbulence happening there. Right? The Reynolds numbers are, are quite large. We are still debating what the source of, uh, of turbulence in disks are. In this case, it is an MHD type of turbulence. This is called the, the, uh, the magneto rotational instability, which will kick in if the disk is sufficiently ionized. So you have dust grains moving in this and then peaking the speeds of the turbulence. We can parameterize what these speeds are in this case by saying that the speeds, the kinetic energy is going to be proportional to the thermal energy. And we can write it in V squared is, is equal to a proportionality quantity that we're just going to call alpha, that we have, could have no idea what it is, times the sound speed. Right? So these are the speeds that the dust grain, I mean, this is the speeds, the, the RMS speeds of the gas. 
the dust grains, the speeds that they will pick, will actually be similar to this, but multiplied by the Stokes number. Right? So the velocity of the dust grains is going to be the Stokes number times the RMS of the gas. Right? Okay. Thanks for the question. Right. <coughs> So there you are. We are in the meter size barrier here then. We have to pass from one to the other. As you asked right from in the beginning of the in the of the beginning of the lecture. In the beginning, then we're growing through heat and stick mechanisms. We call this coagulation. That will stop at either the drift barrier or the fragmentation barrier. There is the meter size barrier. And we need to bypass this if we want to continue go, growing by gravity. Right? How do we do that? Well, there are some ideas. Out there. The very first idea is dust settling by itself. As the dust grows, it starts to decouple from the gas. The gravity from the star will, will, will make the bigger dust grains settle. Right? The smaller dust grains, they are always lofted in the atmosphere of the disk because they are in balance between the gravity from the star and the gas drag. But as the grains grow, they will settle. And uh, maybe that was hypothesized that uh, they, they would settle into a layer that is so thin that you would reach the critical densities by, the, by this settling itself. Right? You would reach the critical densities to achieve gravitational collapse. What are these critical densities? Is, um, if you are able to concentrate enough dust grains, so that you are stable against the tides from the star. There are two forces here. The tide right from the star that is trying to shear this, and the self-gravity of a clump uh, of dust. So a single dust grain does not have enough gravity to attract others, but if you can concentrate a lot of them in the same region in space, maybe their collective gravity is enough to counteract uh, the, uh, the tendency of the shear to spread it uh, away. And then you would form a gravitationally bound object. All right. So maybe then this would work, right? To settle the disk, into the, the, the large grains into the mid-plane, and that settling by itself would lead to a layer that is so dense, right? Because there is no other force. There is just the gravity from the star that is trying to, to, to push it. So the grains would settle into a layer that is infinitely thin, right? That is, uh, if it is infinitely thin, the volume density would be uh, infinite. So you reach the critical densities to form planets. Turns out that that doesn't really work. So what happens if you try to model that? There you go. So this layer is uh, sedimenting. As you see, it's now breaking. And there's something going on there. It breaks into this, this turbulence. So, no. This is not a mechanism to form uh, planetesimals. Uh, because there is something here that is leading to, to, to turbulent uh, behavior. This something turns out to be Kelvin Helmholtz instability. Kelvin Helmholtz is anything that, uh, I mean, it's something that always shows up when you have two fluids. Because when you have two fluids at the interface between them, you build shear, right? And uh, so you have that the gas and the dust, they're flowing at different speeds. So a shear is a gradient in, in velocity, right? It's a, a, a velocity in one direction with a gradient in another direction. So in this case, it is the azimuthal velocity, but a vertical gradient of it. So this shear here, the Kelvin Helmholtz instability, is a primary mechanism for, for turbulence uh, that is converting this shear here into vorticity. That's why you see rolling into these billows. Right? Kelvin Helmholtz instability, as I said, appears pretty much everywhere when you have an interface between two fluids. It can be stabilized by uh, the tension, which is why you don't always see it in the, the ocean, right? You don't have the interface between the, the atmosphere and uh, the water. But in many cases, when it can beat this uh, tension, you see them. You see it in the clouds, right? This is also Kelvin Helmholtz instability uh, seen in clouds. 
So the, the point here is that uh, this is leading to diffusive behavior. Right? So as I said, there was no force to counteract the gravity from the star that is trying to pull the dust grains towards the mid-plane. But because of this turbulence, you have diffusion. So you end up in a steady state between gravity from the star, the star trying to pull the grains down, and diffusion trying to lift them up. So the grains cannot settle into this infinitely dense layer around the mid-plane. Now, this diffusion operates differently depending on the size of the grain. This is a simulation with two different types of grains, small grains and big grains. As you see, the small grains are lofted more, right? They feel more the turbulence. And the bigger grains, which are the yellow ones here, settle into a smaller layer in the disk. So the settling will depend on how big the dust grains are, right? But here, then, we are seeing one thing that, that, that already gives us the hint as to what may be causing this planetesimal to form. Because for the bigger grains, as you can see, this density is not homogeneous. You have some pockets of high density and some pockets of low density. So this is the, this is the, the kernel of the streaming instability is that the dust grains are flowing towards the star. However, this flow itself, this drift itself is unstable, is hydrodynamically unstable. It is not orderly. It's not flowing all with the same density. There are pockets of high density and pockets of low density. And as you concentrate the dust grains, you are slowing the, their drift, right? The dust grains, they are drifting because they're feeling the drag force. But as you concentrate the dust grains, they're going to back react on the gas, and they're going to stop, they are going to slow their flow. And then there, there are more dust grains that are flowing from the outside. If you have a clump that is moving at a slower pace, and there is a dust grain that is moving from the outside in, it's going to be picked by this clump. Essentially, it's a traffic jam. I mean, you live in a city where there are traffic jams all uh, the time. You know how that works. All that it takes is one slow car, right, to create a significant traffic jam. That is what's happening here. You're building these clumps. These clumps slow down. They stop traffic for everybody. And then you have a massive jam. So this is what the streaming instability is doing here. You have a slow, uh, you have drifting dust clump here, right? It moves inwards. It's being picked by the Coriolis force. Because it is being picked by the Coriolis force, now it's going to feel a uh, tailwind. It's going to move outwards, and then it's going to capture the dust grains that are drifting inwards. Essentially, what you have is a runaway process. You have dust concentrations that are reducing the drift. The reduced drift causes dust to concentrate more. And then you are caught in this infinite loop. Uh -huh. Right, dunes, exactly, yes, indeed. Precisely. That's kind of the same thing, too. The, the dust grains here, they're acting to minimize the, the gas drag that they feel, right? So they concentrate, they clump. And as they clump, they slow their drifting down and capture dust grains that are flowing from the outward in, right? So this is a traffic jam instability. <coughs> and it happens, it happens pretty much everywhere in the disk where you have dust flowing in. This, this, this drift is uh, unstable, as you see here. If you wait long enough, you're going to see that the dust is flowing and it's making these this pockets of uh, high density and, and other pockets of low density. So then the hypothesis is, in the regions where you have high dust density, maybe you will achieve the critical density to collapse these dust grains and form a planetesimal. So this is what, uh, what was modeled here in this article. This is a, p a nature paper from 2007. Uh, this paper already has 1,000 uh, citations. It's really groundbreaking from Anders uh, Johansen, uh, now in Copenhagen. You see here, uh, this is a, a flow, I mean, this is a stream of dust, right? And this box here is uh, 
boxing, the most massive clump. This is the calculation where the self-gravity from these dust grains was included. And you're seeing them, a clump forming. And this clump here has three times the mass of Ceres, the most massive asteroid. Okay. So, good. It seems that we are on the right track. We found a mechanism that can concentrate the dust grains, can stop their drift, and uh, can achieve the critical densities to collapse them and form gravitationally bound objects. Right. Uh, so I'll quickly go through this, uh, through this last part of the talk, which is since we are almost running out of, of time. How much time do I have left? All right. Okay. Thank you. That's all that I need. Thanks. All right. So uh, you are collapsing then the dust through this mechanism, right? You, 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 can, you can now concentrate the dust grains to the critical densities to, to produce asteroidal mass objects. Question is then, uh, this is all coming from theory, right? So how can we verify the streaming instability hypothesis? Right? Uh, so there are lots of good people working on this to try to find out if we have, have we found the mechanism to produce planetesimals. So how do we find the evidence for this? First thing is to compare the initial mass function. What, are, what is the mass function of the planetesimals that are formed in simulations? And if you compare to real objects, does it fit? There you go. Here is the, the size of distribution that you get from several different simulations. They seem to have a universal slope right, of about 1.6. This dashed line here is a distribution in the asteroid belt. So it seems that it matches. So yeah, the initial mass function is consistent with the slope of objects in the asteroid belt. Not only that, you notice that there is a, uh, there is a kink here, there is a, a break, right? So these are the objects that are being formed, and around it, that size, there is a break here too. Um, Morbidelli uh, worked, uh, looked at it and then found that um, this kink is not easily reproduced if you start from kilometer size planetesimals, but it will be reproduced if you start from about 100 kilometer size planetesimals. So this is the size function distribution of the, uh, the main belt asteroids. And this is if you augment the mass, right, to match the... the, the, uh, the uh, the mass function that we find in uh, the simulations. So he tried several different uh, types of uh, initial conditions for reproducing this uh, size function and find that if you start from kilometer size of planetesimals, you don't reproduce this. The only way that you do that, that you can reproduce, is if your objects initially are like this. So you can reproduce this size. And you, and you, you reproduce the hun the lower than 100 kilometers only by fragmentation, right? But uh, so this was a sign that then the asteroids were born big, just like we find in uh, the models, that you bypass this meter size uh, barrier by a giant leap, right? By forming already asteroidal size objects instead of one kilometer size objects. Another piece of evidence comes from the Kuiper belt, uh, from so-called cold classical Kuiper belt objects. So the Kuiper belt is divided in you know, several different families. You have the centaurs, you have the resonant objects. Objects are in resonance with Neptune. This is the line here of, uh, um, of objects that will be sca scattered by Neptune. So these objects here clearly had uh, interaction, a history of interaction with Neptune. They're following this line here, right? So this is the scattered disk. And we call these objects here the classical objects, right? So these are objects that are in orbits that have very minimal or zero interaction with the giant planets. They're probably formed in these orbits here between 40 and 50 AU and have been in deep freeze in the Kuiper belt ever since then. So these are our best, belt, best bets to find the pristine, presumably pristine planetesimals. <coughs> And one thing that is seen from these objects is that there is a preference for the binaries to be prograde, right? Several of these objects are equal size binaries. And when you count how many prograde and retrograde there are among these Kuiper belt uh, binaries, there is a strong preference for prograde. 80% of the 
of the objects are prograde and only 20% are retrograde. So if you do a streaming instability simulation and you count the binaries, the form, how many of these are going to be prograde and how many of these are going to be retrograde? That's the question here. So this is a streaming instability simulation forming the planetesimals. So uh, you, can, you can see here, there are several objects that are forming, some of them binaries and all, and then you can count uh, the statistics. Right? So two orbits, four orbits, then all of these objects here right, are planetesimals that formed in uh, the, uh, the model. In measuring the angular momentum of these clumps, you find that the vast majority have too much angular momentum. So they're not going to form a single planetesimal. They're actually going to form binaries. Right? This is the critical angular momentum for their size. Right? So they, they, if they have more angular momentum than this, they're not going to collapse into a single object. They have to form at least two. So this is what, we, I mean, this is what they are seeing here, that the vast majority are in, uh, in at least clumps. So, <clears throat> is there a preference for prograde or, or not? Here then what is seen is the eccentricity of the binaries that are formed and the angular momentum. So, the LZ here. If it is positive, it is a prograde. If it's negative, it is retrograde. So, based on that, you can count then how many of the objects are retrograde versus prograde. Uh, Okay, uh, that was buffering. So there we go. You see a lot more prograde than retrograde ones. So it seems to be on the right track. You do have a preference here for prograde. So these are the planetesimals that are forming. The eccentricity of the binaries. Some of them are hitting one, so they start to merge. Here's following them, right, to the 9, the 12 in here. So this one formed and is existing for a long time, uh, the, uh, the retrograde one. But by and large, you see there is a clear preference for positive angular momentum than for negative angular momentum. So quantifying that, it seems to be indeed that uh, um, sorry, uh, no, this is from the observation. Oh yeah, this is here from the simulation. So this is the result, the dashed line here is from the KBO, and uh, the solid line is a result from the simulation. You see, indeed, that, that is matching the observation. A random distribution, prograde, retrograde, would follow this line here. So the, the streaming instability simulation is reproducing this trend of 80% prograde to 20% retrograde objects. Another interesting bit here is the, uh, the fact that the initial mass function is not is not described by a single power law. It actually seems to have this exponential fall here. So this is a simple power law, the green line, right? And then uh, the red line here is uh, a power law, but, but exponentially truncated at the high mass. So don't care about these units here. That's just a non-dimensionalization of the mass. This is the mass here of the objects, the form, right? Um, if Maybe you can convince yourself that the red line is a better fit than the green line. I have a hard time at that, but uh, I guess on a good day, if I wake up uh, on the right foot, uh, I will maybe convince myself that the red line is a, a better fit. Uh, but what they see here in the observation is that uh, uh, the Kuiper Belt objects, right? So this is the cumulative number of cold classical Kuiper Belt objects. They do seem to follow the dashed line here, which is the exponential tapered, um, essentially, the uh, exponentially cut power law distribution. So this was also seen as observational confirmation of at least a feature of the streaming instability, which is this this exponential cut here at, uh, at high mass. Uh, this is running to different sizes because this is in mass and this is in, in magnitude. Solar system observers like to use this uh, solar system magnitude H, which is normalized to 1 AU, not to 10 parsecs, as uh, the rest of astrophysics likes to use. That means that the bright objects that are big, right? So they're here on this side and not on this side. But you can see here that it's following this. 
line, this exponentially cut line. Right, so the streaming instability seems to solve a lot of our problems on, on, uh, on uh, first, it's a mechanism that is seen in the simulations to work. It reproduces some of the features that are seen in the solar system. Uh, but there is still a lot that we need to understand. Uh, there's, there's, still, uh, there, there's still some problems. So this is one of the things that the field is working on at the moment. Uh, to make it work for different uh, metallicities. So this is the, again, the, uh, that uh, dimensionless stopping time that I was talking about, right, the Stokes number. And then this is the solid abundance, essentially the, the metallicity of uh, uh, the disk or the, the column here in this case. What you see here in green are boundaries where the streaming instability is generating planetesimals or calling it strong clumping. And the pink one is where there's no strong clumping. So read this plot as planetesimals form in the green area and planetesimals don't form in the pink area. Uh, th this was the first boundary that was found here in 2015. And as you see, that spelled trouble because this boundary was actually not even reaching the metallicity of the sun, times the minus two. So you seem to need more metals than what is available, even in the sun, to make that work. This work here found that you could extend by calculating longer and using smaller dust grains. You could extend the boundary towards smaller grains, but not really push it down. And this work here from 2021 found out that you, know, you can actually pull, push this down here if you change the boundary condition in the box. So it's still a field of active research. Come back in one year, this plot will be different. So. We are still working on it. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that question. In fact, yeah, we're working on this suit. Uh, I, would, I would caution against uh, over-interpreting this plot. As I said, it is changing as we speak. There are people working on it right now. And come back in one year, two years, this plot will be different. But it is what we are working with at the the, uh, the moment. If you write a, a paper claiming that uh, you are forming planetesimals, that you are assuming the planets will form around the pop two stars, pop three stars, the referee will be very justified on saying no because of this plot. Yeah. Okay, let's stop here and I uh, will take questions now. Uh, Vladimir, could you uh, show this, uh, the slides that show the uh, nature paper um, on the left? This one? Yes. Uh, uh, what axis is showing the radial direction? Right. Is, the, is the vertical axis? No. So this is a small box. Yes. In the disk, right? So uh, the oh. radio here is the star is on uh, is on the uh, the negative side, like quite far. This is a small yes. box, right? In units of the scale height, right? I went through all of this trouble here to show because every single plot will always have the scale height or the Stokes number. So, you know, it's hard to talk about this field if you don't define the disk quantities first. So this is, yeah, this is uh, the radial direction in units of the scale height. And because the scale height is so small, right, 0 0.05, this is a very tiny box, right? So uh, this is a, just a, a representative box embedded in the disk. The directions are the radial direction and the, uh, the azimuthal. Okay, yeah. okay, thank you. Hi, um, I believe the temperature has uh, a big impact of this everything. So I just want to know 
uh, what is the, the biggest impact of the temperature if, I don't know, mm -hmm. the, the kinetic energy? Right. Yes. Yep. And the, the distance of the, the host star. Right. Okay, so uh, how does the temperature impact? The temperature impact first on the composition, because if you are beyond the snow line, you're going to be playing this game not with silicates, but with ices. And ices stick a lot better than silicates do. So one of the major impacts is actually on the speeds that are going into the fragmentation and on the drift uh, barrier. As you can see here, the speeds by which the, uh, the dust grains are growing through, through Brownian motion is a direct function of the temperature, right? So the, the hotter the gas is, the faster the dust grains will grow. However, as you grow large, you also have the turbulence, which is also a function of the temperature, right? Uh, this, this alpha quantity here is about 10 to the minus 2, which means that the stresses from the turbulence, like how fast uh, the, uh, the gas motions, the RMS gas motions are going, are proportional to the pressure, which is in this case is thermal pressure. So the hotter the disk is, also the faster the gas motions are, and therefore faster the speed that the dust grains are colliding against each other, which will lead to increase the fragmentation. So you increase the coagulation, right, for Brownian motion, but as the dust grains grow in the couple, uh, uh, they will also fragment more. So you make the fragmentation barrier worse. So temperature both helps and, and, uh, and doesn't, right? So uh, in a way, there are some things that are, that are better for planetesimal growth if the, if the disk is hot, but some things are actually better if the disk is, is cold. Right. Okay, thanks. Uh, in many points of your lecture, we see the velocity distribution, right? Let us say. Yeah. And B Maxellian or not, it's, it's, it's quite important now with this Tissalis general theory, you know that, right? From Tissalis, a Brazilian mm -hmm. physicist. So if you apply uh, another statistic for this Maxellian uh, velocity, what do you expect? We can for more grains or less mm -hmm. grains? Yeah, the, the distribution will be Maxwellian for the brown emotions, right? Uh, but as the dust grains grow large, then the, um, the velocity distribution will be given by the RMS speeds of the turbulence. So in this case, we're talking about a, 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 a Komogorov distribution of eddies. Uh, but yeah, like as as you're talking about, uh, if you're talking about the growth, the, uh, the initial growth of for coagulation, yeah, for sure, then the motions will will, will be given by Maxwell Boltzmann. Yeah. That is a safe assumption to make. I also wanted to know how does the sound speed goes with the temperature? Oh, it's a direct function of the uh, temperature. Uh, uh, it's one to one. Uh, is linear or? No, it's quadratic, so that, right? Okay. Temperature is sound speed square, okay. CP over gamma minus one. So yeah, the, the, it goes as a okay. quadratic okay. function. Yes. Okay. CP is the specific capacitor constant pressure. Gamma is the adiabatic index. You can also relate that to um, the Boltzmann constant. So it's a function of the Boltzmann constant the atomic mass, the, 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 the mean uh, molecular weight, but then yeah, you're gonna have the sound speed here. And, the and how does it the decrease sound squared. Uh, with the radius, with the distance from the star? So we are assuming that, uh, we're assuming that it is a power law of index, I said here index Q. Yeah, Q, okay. Yeah. Right, yeah. of yeah. index Q there. Now, and Q is two-ish, is what? Where did I put the Q? Did here. I? Oh, there, okay. There we go, uh, here, here, right. So, um, it's a good point. This Q here, 
for most of this, because it's going to be a plus, actually. I derived it as plus. It's going to be three fourths. Okay. Yes. Not too far from one. Yes. And this comes from balancing the flux from the star that is being absorbed from the flux that the disk uh, is re radiating. Yeah. So if you. If you equate them both, then you find that the, the, the temperature will be given by this uh, power law. I'm trying to find a slide that I had that. Another question? Uh, Vladimir, just to summarize, um, uh, for the gas, you have a steady state, uh, thin, and supercapillarian disk, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but the velocity of the dust is capillarian. Yes. This is the origin of the drift. Yes. Okay. Okay. Correct. Yes. Why is that? Because the, the, the grains, they are... They are orbiting the star. They want to orbit the star in a capillarian way because they are not subject to the gas pressure, whereas the gas is. Right? So the gas is rotating, is orbiting the star at a subcapillarian rate, slightly subcapillarian, right? Because of this correction here. But the, uh, the, the dust grain orbiting at uh, capillary speed, you see here, this is going to give you a difference in the speeds of the, the dust grain and the gas that is off the order of this eta quantity, eta times VK, right? So this eta here being off the order of about 10 to the minus 3, you have a difference in speed between the dust and the gas of about 50 meters per second. So that is what's, what's giving you the... Uh, the uh, the drag and therefore the drift towards uh, the star. The, ga uh, the gas disk itself is not uh, viscose because you assume that the, radi uh, the radio viscosity right, is Right, right, right. Yeah, the gas is viscous, but the viscous speed of the gas is very, is very small. Because uh, you see that from uh, the time scale. The time scale that these disks live is about 10 million years, mm. right? So if you have to cross 100 AU, in 10 million years, you see what the speed is. We're talking about a speed that is much, much less than that. So of the order of a, of a few centimeters per, per second. OK, yeah, right? thank you. Yeah, so it's much, much less. OK. We got to coffee the convenient 50 past. Thank you. Thank you.